All right. Now we're up. All right. And let me tweet it out. So streaming live while we troubleshoot Skype video. <laughs> yeah. Hashtag Skype video. Hashtag horrible Skype. <laughs> <laughs> It's too bad we can't switch to just using pure Hangouts for this. I, I really need two separate applications because we use Hangouts as our broadcast format. Yeah, I know. Uh, of course, if we eliminated Boinks, maybe we'd be able to... Yeah, I don't know. But then we wouldn't be able to do the fancy two-up things where you have like an inset picture next to me. While well, people the, the question is, is that important? Mm. We need to have a meeting. Yeah, I think we need to have a meeting about the future of the show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Ooh. Now you're getting a little deeper than. <laughs> <laughs> Are we even going to do a show, Matt? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Is it worth it? It's so worth it. Oh wait, I have got an idea. Wait, are we live yet? Yeah, we are live. We okay, never mind. Ideas, <laughs> well, what well, were you gonna try, Jason? Oh, I was. Uh, I'm. I'm running a Skype app right now. I was thinking I could just uh, try running a executable off my desktop. Oh. We would love you to try that. Yeah, that sounds great. Okay, okay my apologies to all the live people. I'm going <laughs> to go ahead and do this right now. No, this is very entertaining. We promise. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so let's see. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, <laughs> this this might take a few minutes to, to do. All right. We can wait. Um, so let's see. Uh Skype for Windows Desktop. <laughs> oh, man, do I even know my Skype address? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> if there's anything the kids love more than comics, it's it's uh, tech troubleshooting. <laughs> uh, no, actually, people like to see like how, how things are made, right? They're getting to see us... like. Uh, Get, get, get to hear Matt go, oh, gee, in the background. <laughs> I'll tell you, oh, geez. So I just got, Boink just told me GIFs are unacceptable images. Oh, that picture's a, 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 a GIF file? Yeah. Hold Wait, on. why is it asking me to make beating my search engine? Because <laughs> <laughs> it's Microsoft. <laughs> oh, how annoying. I saw a Bing car driving around the other day. You know how sometimes you see those Google cars with the giant pole on the top? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw one, uh, except it was a Bing car. Okay. Um, hey, Matt, just do a Google image search for Jason Shiga. Oh, sorry, I could, just got it to work. Oh, great. Okay. Um, I just have to build a new layer real quick. Ah, I see that you're building it now. And yes. we may not even need it. All your effort might be for naught, Matt. I'm, I would be happy, but I... <laughs> just need to make sure this works. And now I'm getting a phone call. <laughs> oh wait, uh, <laughs> this is gonna sound really stupid, but what's my what's my Skype name? Uh, I'm seeing. Oh, here, hold on. Uh, let me look it up in my email real quick because it, it's just showing me your your real name in. Um... And now I'm afraid to say it out loud because I don't want you to get a bunch of Skype prank calls. <laughs> Uh, let me pull it up real quick, and then I will send it to you via chat. Um, where is it? Ah. Oh, yeah, you never sent it to me via email. Okay, Matt, I'm going to take the mouse just for a second. Go right ahead. Thank you. All right, and let me just pull up your account and see if I can get your username that way. Oh. oh, weird. We oh, okay. Okay, so, Jason, I'm going to chat you It's uh, what your username is, okay? Okay. Gosh, this is so weird. I can't even figure out what my own <laughs> username is. There it is. Oh, there it is. <laughs> You could have probably guessed in like three or four tries. Well, I just oh. just for the sake of his privacy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I think I see it. Is it Jason? Oh wait. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That was like a Tim Conway joke. It's like, what's my password? <laughs> I'll text it to you. Oh, it's password one two. Thanks. Uh, oh shoot. 
Uh, I still have to frame Dave. Oh yeah, let's frame him up. Frame him up. Frame him up. Uh oh. And I'm gonna. I brought this to talk about on the show today, everybody. Anybody read this? What is that? Knock knock. It's one of Jason's earlier books. Oh no, I haven't read that. Hand bound. Oh. Shoot, I don't even know my Skype password. Hold on. Okay, no big. Oh. Let me see. But it's it's another it's another book where um. Every there's like a million different ways to go through it. It's one of those choose your own okay. adventure kind of uh, stories where a guy knocks at your door with a gun, and then you have to choose: do you answer the door, or do you jump out the window? And then those two choices lead to other choices, and so on. It's gotcha. Amazing. Yeah, all, all I can see, Jersey, is a giant white rectangle. Oh, because yeah, you're seeing <laughs> me on the webcam, which is like it's yeah. all washed out. <laughs> Great book, though. I don't think it's available anymore, though, right, Jason? Um. It's. I have about 15 copies left. Oh. Wow. Uh, so whenever I go to a convention, uh, I bring a few, and uh, I'm slowly getting rid of them. But uh, I figure in a, a few years they should all be gone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, you're on. looking my way as if as if you're doing book recommendations right now, Rachel. Yes. We're 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 framing up, it we're framing up our librarian shot, right. the librarian okay. cam. All right. All right. Okay, hold on. Oh gosh, what's my password? <laughs> that we really don't want you to say over air. <laughs> <laughs> oh, are you all set with the mouse? Oh, I'm done with the mouse. If you, if you, uh. I'm just labeling some of the new stuff. All right, and then, I mean, obviously, if Jason gets his video working in the next couple of minutes, then we're going to need you to come in to frame up his shot, too, right? Uh -huh. And I know you've got a ticking clock, Dave. Um, yeah, i gotta, I got to be done by 1 o'clock Okay. for my next video conference call. <laughs> Do you use Skype? No, we're using uh, Google Hangouts for that one. Oh. See what I'm Go saying? See, I'm aware. I'm aware. <laughs> 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 no, Google Hangouts isn't perfect either, but it's closer. Yeah, we're doing um, grad student interviews, so grad student interviews for uh, for for GSI position in the library. Oh, their positions opening up at at the the Duderstadt? Uh, yeah, for for students at uh, the library school. Oh. Uh, so, um, so you have to you have to already be accepted for the fall, and have applied two months ago. <laughs> to work to work in the video game library, archive. Yeah, well, one of the places you would work. Yes. So, so next year, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get a lot of applications for that for the uh, video game archive position? Um, well, this position isn't technically a video game archive position. Uh, we, we do have um, we do hire students so to be like student workers in the archive. Uh, we usually hire late August, mid to late August, um, and we get several um, for that. Hmm. You know, it's 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 a job where you sit in the archive and and watch people play video games. <laughs> <laughs> well, people do that on you YouTube. Check. Like the most popular YouTube user is a guy who does that, right? Yeah. And you know, you check things out to people. You you yell at people to put their backpack and the you know, and the cubbies and take their coats off and dot to bring food in and you know it's so they it's, don't uh, so they don't walk out with Chuck Norris super kicks. Right, exactly. <laughs> One of the prizes of the collection. <laughs> I still need to go there and play it. Hey, speaking of uh, local news, Dave, uh, do you know what the status is on Pinball Pete's? How they're doing? Because I no, walked by there recently, no, they're I, still closed. Yeah, well, I, I guess they're. Aren't they still open in the basement of the of the place across the street? Oh no, I didn't know. Uh, th where they've been forever, where they've been forever, um, down uh, you know where the um, the Galleria there, where the yeah. post office is and yeah. Starbucks and everything. Yeah, but they had that big f the the water pipes burst over the winter and. Oh yeah, yeah, but no, the pipes have been fixed. Uh huh. Um, that was a, a week or two ago. Those those were fixed up. I don't know if pizzas opened back up or not. Uh. Um. I guess I assume they did because everybody else in there did. Okay. Well, I good. thought you were talking about the fire in the building across the street. Oh, no, no. I wasn't talking about that one. Oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> Man, Pinball Pizza is cursed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 
Uh, I just hope it's up and running in time for Kids Read Comics this summer. Uh, oh, yeah. Um, Jason, are you still there? Uh, yeah, you know, guys, I don't think this is going to work. You're not going to get the video working? That's fine. Yeah, sorry. That's all right. We we we'll, we'll, we got a uh, a screen grab of you that we'll use in place of a uh a you know a video feed and uh you know we'll still have serviceable audio. You sound great. So. All right. Well, man. Well, I guess we gave it a try. Yeah. Yeah. No. And we we got we got to get the show on the road so Dave doesn't doesn't have a whole lot of time to be with us. Um, and I want to respect your time as well, Jason. So. All right. Uh, um, okay, so here's how it breaks down, guys. Um, David, you've seen the, how the show is made, but yep. we usually run, um, we do the show all in one take, and we run an intro and an outro. So there'll be intro music that plays, and we just sit quiet for 40 seconds while that plays, and then I come in with, hey, it's Comics are Great, the visual storytelling show. And then when we're done, when I say, okay, bye, after an hour, um, Matt's going to run some ending credits with like link, you know, like your sites mentioned and everything, and we won't hear each other for about, I'm guessing about 30 seconds, and then when that, when you hear me again, that signifies that the show is over and the stream is being killed and everything. That makes sense. Yep. Sounds good. Okay, and uh, I am because it's streaming live. I'll be monitoring the uh, the chat. We've got uh, a comment stream going out on the event page, and I might be relaying some questions from the audience, you guys, which. I just say to the audience watching live, if you guys want to participate, use the comments underneath the video and on the event page, which you can get to at comicsagreat.com slash live. Uh, I will watch there for your comments. And then you could also say, hey, go to the Twitters and Facebooks and all those places say, I'm about to watch a cool thing, comicsagreat.com slash live. Jason Shiga is going to be there to talk about uh, his career and his awesome, awesome comics. And we're going to learn a little bit about mini comics as well from uh, Dave Carter the librarian of the video game and comics archive at the Duderstadt Center. At, is it the Duderstadt Center? We're in the Duderstadt Center, yes, sir. Yeah. I, I didn't know if it was the Duderstadt something else. Not it's the center, center, yes. Center <laughs> at, at the University of Michigan. So it'll, it's going to be a fun one. Uh, tell your friends, comicsagreat.com slash live. So are you guys ready? We are ready. Things? Wait, wait, wait. Do Oops. you mind if I try one more thing? No, go for it. <laughs> try okay. one more thing. <laughs> Here's here's what I love about about Jason Shiga is that a lesser guest would be like, I don't know why it's not working. Must be on your end. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but Jason's like, let me try to fix this. This must be fixed. That's awesome. Uh, this really did turn into the making of episode. Yeah, it really did. <laughs> That's cool. Okay, this, okay, I give up. This I is how up. the sausage is made. Let's uh, let's just go ahead. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, well, we got a good shot of you that we could use on the show. Okay. So, okay, uh, if you guys are ready. I'm ready. Go All for right. it. Matt, are you ready? Matt? Yep. Yeah, all ready. Sorry, I was just talking into Jersey's headphones. Okay, so, uh, yeah, hit it. I'm going to need everybody quiet for about 30 seconds. It's Comics Are Great, the visual storytelling show recorded live every other week at the Ann Arbor District Library in um, sweet yet rainy and gray uh, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Comics.aadl.org. This is a show where we talk about making comics, uh, writing comics, drawing comics, the lifestyle of a cartoonist, all the stuff that goes into this medium that drives us all mad. My name is Jersey Drozd, cartoonist and teaching artist. And with me today, we've got a new guest on the show I'm so excited to talk to. Uh, Speaking of sweet, one of the sweetest guys in comics, Jason Shiga, oh. is here. Hey, Jason. Hi, everybody. I'm Jason Shiga. <laughs> Jay, now, we don't have video for you. Uh, anybody who was watching the pre-show uh, saw that we were having all sorts of video issues with getting you um, uh, 
you know, get, getting your, your video feed pumped in through Skype. Thanks, Skype. Thanks for nothing. You're like the Amtrak <laughs> of video conferencing. Uh, but we, we at least got your voice. You sound great. Now, Jason Shiga of shigabooks.com, meanwhile, is what you're widely known for. Also, um, Empire State from Abrams Books. Uh, yes, that's my most recent book. Yeah, came out in 2011. Uh, a romance story or not. Uh, we'll talk about that today. Uh, Zerich Award winner, mini comic maker, indie self-publisher, web comic maker with your new comic, Demon. Uh, we're talking about all that stuff today, but I wanted to get you introduced because then i got to introduce the other guest who is not going to be here for very long today. We've got returning to the show, Dave Carter. Of, hey, Jersey. Uh, hey, Dave. Lib.umich.edu slash mini comics day. That's right. right. Um, Jer Jersey, you've been um, gracious enough to allow me on your show yet again <laughs> to plug <laughs> the, uh, this time the fourth annual Mini Comics Day at the Dude. Uh, that's the Duderstadt Center, which is on uh, north campus of the University of Michigan here in Ann Arbor. And uh, the date for that this year is this coming Saturday. That's March 22nd, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. And um, you can go online to lib.umich.edu slash minicomicsday where you'll find uh, information about it and the sign-up link. So you can go and sign up. And it's um, when you sign up, that lets me know who's coming so I know how much food to get. Um, and it takes take you 30 seconds to sign up to let me know you're coming, so I certainly appreciate that. Um, but I'm sure, Jersey, your first question is, what is Mini Comics Day? Right. That um, <laughs> <laughs> Are we turning into a 1950s uh, science film strip? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Gee, Mr. Carter, what is a mini comic? <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> so at Mini Comics Day, uh, what we do is we get a bunch of uh, cartoonists and art students and librarians like me uh, who have no business drawing comics um, all getting together in a room, um, and for eight hours we draw mini comics. And sort of our the goal is to try to produce an eight-page mini comic in eight hours. It's like a mini version of 24-hour comics day. Um, and uh, and the great thing is just getting a bunch of people together who, who like comics, who like to draw comics, and you can um, sort of lock away the everything from the outside world that's usually competing against your time and just use those, that time to hang out with other people who like to make comics and just make comics. And we do it all by hand. Uh, you know, people are sitting there with pen and, pen and pencil and paper and whatever other tool, crayons or colored pencils or, you know, whatever you, markers, whatever you want to bring. Um, and just making comics, and uh, for those for those who are like um, professionals and stuff like that, it's a good time to sort of get back to the basics. Uh, for people like me who just normally just read comics, it's a great way to um, to learn about what goes into making a comic. You, I, the first time I tried to make a comic of my own, I learned so much about you know panel transitions and how much dialogue you can put into a, into a single panel and all that kind of stuff that that. It seems to flow effortlessly when you're reading a professionally produced comic, and you think, "Oh my gosh, this is hard." <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so even if you don't see yourself as a cartoonist, it's a good opportunity to uh, to to learn firsthand about how how comics are made. Yeah, and and it's a way to you know, comics is a solitary endeavor. It is often you at a desk alone, and it's nice to get out of the studio and go and be around people to you know, work to not work together collaboratively, but necessarily, but to just work in the same space, right? Right, right. You know, one of the things we talked about, we did like a, you and Maggie Ram were on the show uh, last year or the year before um, talking about our, our reflections on Mini Comics Day. And right. I think one of the things we talked about was when everybody hit that low point at the yeah. same time <laughs> where like you could hear everybody going like, oh, this is the point in the process where I feel like this is garbage and I'm no good and I have no business drawing this anymore. And then like we all came out on the other side at the same time and we were all cheering together. It's right, right. <laughs> a lot of fun. So March so, 22nd. March 22nd. That's this Saturday. It's coming up really soon. Um, oh so I, I brought some examples here I t can show in the next couple minutes. I don't know. Can you see this on the? Yeah. Yeah. See that on there? So this is my comic for, from last year. It's the secret history of the space monkeys. Um, you can see um, that I use uh, s stick figures <laughs> <laughs> and not not even good stick figures <laughs> on that. And uh, for, for this one, I, I took and I, I ended up taping in some old library catalog cards in it as part, as part of the comic in, in that. So that was something new I sort of employed in, in doing that. 
Um, so, so now let me show you like a good mini comic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's an example from Matt Fuzel, who, who uh, have, you've, you've had Matt on the show before, haven't you? Oh Jerry? yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Uh, so his one of his many, um, many, many comics. That's have to try to say that three times fast, but that. Um, here's here's one by uh, Maya Gosling. She's she's part of the one of the workers here at the library. She she comes and she likes to make. She makes comics about rock climbing and working on working as being a cataloger and all that all that fun kind of stuff. Um, so, uh, well, we, here's the other thing: when you finish these books, if you finish them and get them photocopied there at the Duder stack, because there's equipment there to get printed, it gets added to the collection at the the comics collection there. Yes. Oh yeah, we um, we we don't force you to give a copy to us, but we we certainly appreciate it. <laughs> um, and so we we get them into the collection. They get cataloged and and put in and for future generations to. Come and look at your work, and uh, you know one of the things I do is I bring uh, mini comics from our collection to the mini comic stage, so you can look through them and kind of get inspired by what other people are doing. Uh, I I just like mini comics because they're like so raw. You know, yeah. there's it's kind of especially these ones that are just created in eight hours. You don't you don't have much time to ruminate and reflect <laughs> necessarily. It's more of a you know it's your your it and your ego putting out a comic without the super ego getting in the way. <laughs> Well, Dave, we know that you got to get going because you got another meeting to get to. But thanks for taking time to stop by to remind us about Mini Comics Day. Yeah, thanks, for, <laughs> thanks so much for having me, and I um, hope to see people come and and uh, sign up and come on Saturday, Mini Comics Day, and it's, it's great fun. So, uh, thanks again. Thanks, it's, Dave. It's at live.umich.edu/slash Mini Comics Day. Indeed. So. All right, and have a great conversation with Jason. All right, see you, Dave. Yep, All right. So, Jason. Jason. You know, it's funny. Um, speaking of mini comics, uh, <laughs> it's, I think, pretty much 100% of the cartoonists I know my age got their start doing comics uh, via mini comics. That's how you got started, too, isn't it? That's, that's how everyone I know got started, um, at least uh, of, of uh, my peers. I uh, imagine, uh, you know, uh, kids starting out today probably uh, get their start with web comics. But uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, one generation, one half generation ago, that was that was the way to get started. You know, I wonder if we could just start there with this this discussion because I want to talk about like the whole arc of your career and what the takeaway is, and it based on something you blogged about recently on your on your site. Um, when you say like a lot of people, okay, a lot of people maybe start a web comic, but. There's an implicit suggestion, and maybe, and maybe this is my bias talking as an older guy who, you know, I was in my mid-20s when webcomics really took off. Um, but there's an implicit suggestion in webcomics that you're in it for some kind of haul, right? And, and some people like Ryan Estrada, they do like, you know, limited things. But there's, there's, there's for the most part, I think, when you do a webcomic, it's like, I'm going to be doing this for a while. Whereas a mini comic, it's like it is something you could do in an afternoon, and it is something where it's like I could just fiercely throw out some ideas and not be too uh, precious about it. Um, and then also, there's like there's something valuable about watching the work stack up, right? I've got 12 mini comics now. I've got evidence. I've got artifacts of my effort. Whereas in web comics, like well, I've got you know <laughs> 75 comics in the archive, right? Right. So I'm, I'm just wondering if there's still like a value to doing mini comics just for the sake of it, right? Because of the benefits that come out of it. I mean, what benefits did you get out of doing mini comics when you were starting out? Um, yeah. Well, gosh, man. I mean, it was uh, it was it was essentially my my comics schooling, uh, if I could put it that way. Um, I guess there. I mean, now that there actually are schools, it's uh, I guess it, things have. Uh, completely changed, but uh, yeah, it's uh, you know just make. I mean, you know, the best way to learn something is by doing it, and you know, I think that applies to comics as well. Um, and yeah, just uh, just hanging out with my friends, you know, making a comic, just learning what it takes to physically make a book, and then at the end, having a book that you can hold in your hands was uh. Yeah, it's just such a great, uh, great learning experience. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I still, I, you know, I don't. Um, I guess a lot of uh, a lot of people might see mini comics as uh, sort of a 
stepping stone to uh, getting picked up by a publisher or something. But uh, man, I I love mini comics, and I you know I'm still I'm still making them. Same here. No, I adore them. I adore the, the the notion that it's it's a way to stay limber about your craft, and it's a way to engage with the whole artistic arc that. Um, Kazu Kibuishi famously, you know, talked about a while back, where he's talking about, you know, you like you start out going like this is going to be great, and then the middle part you go, this is terrible. I'm terrible. No, it wasn't so bad. Oh, that was <laughs> that was awesome. I want to do it again. You know, yes. uh, you do that in a, like a, a graphic novel, like say like Empire State, where it's like, what is this thing? It's like two hundred something pages. Uh, I'm not sure. I think a uh, hundred and fifty, a hundred and eighty. It's a lot of pages, a lot of panels, right? There's there's a lot of opportunities here for you to feel rotten about the process. Right to let let the ennui set in when not that the book's bad, but the process of of you know engaging with it every day. Whereas with a mini comic, you just get it out, go through the whole cycle in an afternoon. But there was something else you said in there that I thought was really cool. Is that you're also if you don't have any experience doing like book layout, pagination, yeah, you know, setting up flats for for a printer, quote unquote. In, in our case of mini comics, a photocopy machine. Yes. Yeah, it's good practice for all that stuff. Yeah, no, I mean you learn you learn every every step of the process. Um, That's true. And yeah, I mean just fr just from coming up with the idea to pr printing, watching the pages fly out of the uh, copy machine. And also, also there's like a sense of the artist touched this. Like, okay, so here I've got in my hands I got Empire State published by Abrams, beautiful book, gorgeous book, and yeah. then I've got Knock Knock, which is Hand bound, <laughs> hand photocopied, uh, and you know personalized to me, which was also nice. But I feel like, you know, Jason put this thing together from scratch. Jason made this thing with his hands, whereas this is like, yeah, he did that with this too, but you know, it went to a printer and it was a digital file and so on, right? There's right. something about that artist's like, you know, that that personal. Oh, is it is it art artisanal? I don't know what that is. Touch. <laughs> but. Uh, but anyway, so okay, well, but I, I think it's I think it's cool that you still like to make them because uh, I I do too, and you know I like this idea that you you're an Ignatz winner, you're an Eisner winner, you got won the Zurich Award, you know you're a decorated cartoonist, you've got good reviews, lots of people, you know Time there's an article on Time article on uh, in uh, Wired about you, you know you don't need to mess around with this rinky dink stuff anymore, yet you like to because. Uh, I love it. I love. <laughs> I love. I love mini comics. What can I say? It's uh, yeah, just this um, yeah, like well, yeah. I don't want to repeat myself, but yeah, just uh, <laughs> going for you know, just going from a a thought in your head to having a physical object, you know, that you can hold in your hands. Really quick. It's, uh, yeah, it's hard to think of another way uh to do that as quickly as uh, as mini comics. All right, so let's back up then, and I want to walk through just briefly your career and get to my big twenty thousand dollar question. Okay. Uh, okay. So you started out with Double Happiness. You started out before that, but Double Happiness was the project where you got the Zurich Award. Now, That's right. to bring people up to speak, because like nowadays, I mean, there may be cartoonists who n don't know what the heck that is, but that you know, ten years ago. You know, 12 years ago, the Zero Chord was kind of a big deal. Oh uh, my gosh, I love, yeah. yeah, man, can I, you mind if I just talk about the Zero Grant for? Yeah, for, please. Uh, yeah, it's one, I mean, gosh, it's one of those, it's one of those things. I. It's just been such an influential part of so many cartoonist careers. Um, it just, you know, I, I mean, if you look at the, if you look, um, if you go to Wikipedia or whatever and look at the list of Zarek winners uh, over the, you know, over the, um, over its run, it's, yeah, it's just like a who's who of, uh, you know, al alter alternative cartoonists working today. Uh, so, like, uh, I forget who, who, especially in the early rounds, like, you'll see names like uh, Tom Hart and Adrian Tomine, Jessica Abel, wow. uh, Gene Yang, uh Derek Kirk Kim. Derek Kirk Kim, that's right. Um, yeah, all these, all these names, and uh, yeah, it's um, basically uh, to to go a little bit into the history. Uh, I guess it was it was started by uh, Peter Laird. He was one of the uh, creators of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, mm -hmm. and uh, he, um, I guess he he got a start uh, making Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. 
um, essentially as a, as an alternative comic. Um, he just raised the funds, hired a printer, uh, printed uh, you know a few thousand copies of his book, and that that's basically uh, how the how the Turtle Empire got started. Um, and I guess uh, you know now that, now that they're both gazillionaires, I guess he thought it would uh, you know it'd be the, a great idea and uh, to start this uh, grant for uh, cartoonists who uh, kind of wanted to do the same. Um, and I think he's given away over a million dollars at this point wow. uh, via the Zara grant. So uh, yeah, it's a, it's an amazing grant. Unfortunately, uh, it ended a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it just uh, it changed uh, so many uh, cartoonist lives. Well, you you said specifically so careers. on your blog, you said it was literally a life changing amount of money for me and reshaped my entire career and life trajectory. Those are the words you used to describe what it was like in the Zarek Grant. So yeah. how so? How did it, how did it like change your life trajectory? Um, well, I I mean, <clears throat> I think well, it's one thing it's one thing to make. Uh, you know, twenty copies of your mini comic and sell them at a you know at the local comic book store. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, once you're, uh, I guess the the Zara grant I got was for five thousand dollars, and uh, yeah, I I basically uh, printed up three thousand uh, copies of my uh, of my book, which uh, gosh uh, is probably. Um, Hundreds, hundreds of times more than my highest print run mini at that time. Uh, so it just, I mean, just the the numbers, the the quantities, the money, all all the all that stuff involved just kind of uh, forced me to think about comics more seriously. Well, yeah, I remember the application form for the Zarek Grant. It really, I mean, it's a grant, and and, and if you if for those listening or watching who don't know about grant writing, they want to know what you're going to do with every penny of that money. It's not just like, is your stuff good? Yeah, you deserve $5,000 to print it up. No, they want to know what printer you're going to go through, what distribution method that you've chosen, uh, what kind of you know pr production quality are you going to do in color, are you going to do it in black and white, what kind of way, what methods are you going to use to promote this thing to get it into the hands of people. They want you to basically set up as a small business in order to, it's, so not only does the work have to be good, but you have to have a plan around right. that work, right? Right. So, um, so did that did, did writing that grant affect how you approached later works? Um, well, okay. Uh, to be to be honest, I basically uh, just copy and pasted Jean Yang's uh, Zarek grant. <laughs> uh, Jean, Yang, Jean Yang got a Zarek grant uh, a couple years before me and I asked him if I could take a look at his grant application. So. So there's a first bit of advice in grant writing. Find a friend and copy. <laughs> oh, that's great. Um, so yeah, I didn't I didn't actually think about it too seriously um, okay. until I actually got it. And then at that point, I was like, oh, crud, what am I going to do? Yeah, you still got to make good on all those promises that were in that grant, right? Right. And the I guess the thing is you can't... It's it's $5,000, but they don't, they don't just write you a check for $5,000. Mm. Uh, you know, you can't you can't just buy five thousand dollars worth of video games or whatever. Um, you actually have to um, either give them quotes and then uh, they'll reimburse you for the amount in the quote, or uh, you give them receipts and they'll reimburse you for uh, the amount on the receipt. Mm. Um, so yeah, at that point it was it was, uh, was kind of like that movie's Brewster's Millions, where I was just like, oh crowd, how you know what am I how am I going to spend five thousand um, dollars? <laughs> and then yeah, I remember like at the end I was there was I'd only used up like forty five hundred dollars. I was like, oh, I still have five hundred dollars I need to spend, and wow. you know I've only got one week to spend five hundred dollars on something. And I remember I walked into the post office and asked for five hundred dollars worth of stamps. <laughs> did, um, did you get them? Yeah, <laughs> that's and awesome. I, I yeah, I sent them the receipt for five hundred dollars worth of stamps, and they uh, they reimbursed me for it. They weren't forever stamps at that time, were they? 
No. Oh. <laughs> yeah, it was really uh, the unfortunate part was I think just like a few months later they raised the price by like three cents. Uh. Uh, so then I had to buy all these three cent stamps, <laughs> and it took it took me years to go through all those stamps. Oh my gosh. But uh, yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't want that money to. <laughs> I didn't want that money to go to waste. Except I guess it wouldn't really be wasted because it'd just be going back to Peter Laird. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but 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 it was it was it was earmarked for you, right? So make use out of it. Okay. Yeah. So so there we start with this. You know, here you are doing this comic, and you got a grant, which it's a prestigious grant, right? There's like there's like a an air of quality around the word Zurich. Right, we know that they only choose really worthy works to be selected for that. But then, it, but here's the downside: you got to think like a business. You have to think about, you know, all of the production, and you have to manage all these finances. Even though um, it's essentially found money, you have to use it responsibly. Uh, you couldn't just go out to, you know, In and Out Burger and spend five thousand dollars on, <laughs> right. you know, on fries. Uh, so then we get to. You know, later on in your career, Meanwhile comes out and it, and it, it, it gets traction. And for those who haven't seen Meanwhile, it's a choose your own adventure book um, where it's it, we've talked about it on the show before. Wait, 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 before we get to Meanwhile, can I talk a little more about the Zarek Grant? Oh, what, please. What, what, <laughs> what actually happened with this book? Sure. No, I, I want to hear it. Yeah. Okay. So. <laughs> Sorry, sorry to interrupt you, but it's yeah. no man. This is your show, man. I want to hear it. It's a funny story. So okay, so anyways, I got the I got the I got the money. Um, I yeah, I didn't. And and I think this is this is a pretty common experience with Zerk winners, but they they don't know exactly how to spend it or what to do or how to turn that into books. Um, so I got um. It yeah, it was so difficult trying to figure out like diamond and how to yeah how to navigate that whole thing and printers and oh my gosh it was such a headache. Um, I finally did it uh, and I think I got 700 orders uh, for my book. Um, and I figured uh, I didn't I didn't time it quite right because normally you're supposed to get the orders and then send the print job, uh, oh. but I. I contacted the printers first. And I was like, "Print up three thousand copies of my book. <laughs> I want to. I want to max out the, uh, you know, the the Zarek money." Right. Um. So, anyways, uh, so yeah. So basically, I think I sold about a thousand altogether when all was said and done. So, do you still have some copies of Double Happiness? So, uh, for a while, I had about 2,000 copies of Double Happiness just in the house, and yeah. um, I had them in these boxes. They came direct from the printer, um, and I basically uh, stacked the boxes in such a way that it made a giant armchair. <laughs> um, so, yeah, people would just come to my house and sit on this. Uh, it looked more like a throne that was just made out of <laughs> copies of Double Happiness. And uh, yeah, it. I mean, you know, maybe every three or four years, I'd break open one of the boxes. But yeah, at a certain point, I was just like, "There's, there's no way. There's no way I can, I can get rid of all these books." And uh, yeah, I. I'm sorry to say, I just. Uh, I think after six or seven years, I just. Uh, I just recycled all the all of those books. Oh man, no, I. I I, I I hear you. My very first self-published work I did in 1994, and I went through all of the traditional distribution channels like you do. And I and I did the same thing where I was like, I'm gonna need you know 2,000 <laughs> copies because this is gonna be big because this is awesome. And then uh, I solicited. And I think I got like four orders uh, that I had to mail out. <laughs> And like with the unit cost, because you know Diamond took like it's what is it sixty percent or something like that. I forget because I haven't gone through Diamond since. But it, like it wound up costing me money to get those books out, and I still have. I think I have like three hundred copies left of that print run that I just I can't bring myself to get rid of. But for many years, like I'd move from apartment to apartment. I'm like, why am I still carrying around all these books? <laughs> uh, uh, well, the, I guess another thing is the way printing works is uh, I, I forget the exact numbers, but it was like you know something like you know for two thousand dollars, you know we can print up a thousand copies of Double Happiness, mm. but for two thousand three hundred dollars, we can print up three thousand. Yeah. So I was just like, oh, why not just kick them an extra, you know, few hundred dollars? I can get three times as many. Right. Yeah. So, the, the way the print. But, 
But see, I mean, that's the kind of thing that you only learn when you actually engage with those kinds of companies. You, you didn't know that. Well, your background is in mathematics, actually. That, that's what your degree is in, right? Right. Uh, but even when you're going to art school, I don't... I, when I was going to school, that wasn't something that we were taught. It's something you learn by just going out and doing it, right? Right. So that, that's that's one of the cool things about things like the, the Zarek Grant. And now we got Kickstarter, which kind of filled that gap and kind of democratized it in a way. Like now anybody, you know, there's no committee deciding. The committee is the public. You know, right. can, can you reach the public and do they approve? Um, um, yeah, I haven't confirmed this, but I, I suspect the, the advent of Kickstarter was probably one of the reasons uh, they decided to end the Zarek Grant. Hmm. It seems like it could have. St I, I haven't been following the news closely on that, and like I, I, I just remember reading a, a, a little story about it when it, when they decided to close the doors on it. But it seems like something like that could still exist as a prestigious award, right? It's not only the money, but it's also this is a jury thing where getting this is kind of like getting an Eisner, kind of like getting an Ignatz, right? You know, it's 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 your peers saying this is worthy, more people should pay attention to it, right? right. Whereas Kickstarter, yeah, you can get funding. You can get a lot of funding actually if you're if you're crazy good at you know working your hustle. But it's mm, is that the same as being able to put the little laurels like they put in front of indie movies? I don't know. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, well, I don't know. I mean, personally, I'd rather have the money. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I guess you're right. Uh, as they say, it talks, right? But uh, but you know, it's like you don't need. The money anymore, right? Because Abrams, hello, you're published by the big boys now. This book is in bookstores everywhere. Uh, and they take care of a lot of that hustle for you. You didn't have to talk to printers. You didn't have to work with distributors. All you had to do was produce the work, work with your editor, you know, craft into the best thing it could be, maybe work with some designers to get the cover design and maybe some of the interior things worked out. Uh, headache removed. Yes. So now yes. you just, now you just oh do my gosh, and and the best part, I never have to cut out a single tab again. <laughs> oh, that's uh, right. Let me, I don't know if you have the mini comic version of Meanwhile, but uh, I've seen pictures, and I and that was that was actually a question I had slated was were you hand cutting all those tabs in the Meanwhile? Yes. Oh, so every God. single one of those tabs in the mini comic version, I cut myself by hand. Um, there's uh, 72 pages. Uh, in each copy of Meanwhile. So that's about 72, yeah, 72 tabs I had to cut uh, just just for one copy. And uh, I remember working it out. I must have I must have uh, printed or self uh, self published about a thousand copies over the course of the mini comics run. So, wow. oh my gosh! When yeah, when Abrams when Abrams told me they wanted to uh, to do Meanwhile, I was yeah, I was I was dancing a little jig. I was <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh, never again! I <laughs> never have to cut out another tab. We've got machines that can do that, right? Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. So, and then we get to I'm gonna I'm gonna fast forward a little bit, and I and the reason I'm fast forwarding is I know we're gonna come back to talking about uh, Empire State and Meanwhile as we reflect on wh where I'm going with this. Um, but now you're doing a webcomic. That's right. Webcomics are for starting things up. It's for people who don't have a publisher. It's for people who don't have an agent. Why are you doing webcomics? That's silly talk. You have the machinery in place to make your dreams come true. Why go back to just creating a WordPress site and sharing your comics that way? Um, well, <laughs> um, I got yeah, I mean... I get yeah. I well, Jersey. I'm not gonna lie to you. It's uh, Abrams didn't want to publish Demon. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> so this is the, the web is where you put your failures. <laughs> 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 no, but you you said yourself. You put, there's a blog post on shigabooks.com where you were explaining why this is a web comic. So it's, it's a book called Demon. Yes. And you said that it's pure insanity. And I mean, I've been reading it. And it's it's this guy who wakes up every every afternoon. I think it's afternoon because it's like one thirteen when he wakes up, right? Uh huh. Um, and tries to kill himself, and he yeah. succeeds every time. But then he wakes up the next day in some kind of weird Groundhog's Day thing. But the evidence of his past failures keeps showing up. So like he blows his brains out, wakes up the next day, there's the bullet in the wall. So he clearly did it. So what's going on here? Um, yes. 
I, yeah. I, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add on to that 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 uh, elevator pitch for what demon is. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, you know, actually, I, I that's yeah, that's that's a great elevator pitch. I haven't come up with a good one myself, but uh, <laughs> but ba- basically, you don't yeah, you don't have to worry about uh, this this con- this, uh, this failed suicides. Uh, a story going on for 700 pages. Um, it's, it's, well, we're only at the beginning. I mean, you've got like a progress meter on the the comic, and we're only like what, like four percent, eight percent in, or something like that. Yes. Uh, so, but yeah. So the the whole thing is going to be about 750 pages uh, when it's done. Um, but uh, I guess the uh, the original plan was I would release it in issues. Um, uh, and I guess uh, uh, each issue would be around 36 pages, and um, I guess at the uh, maybe at the end it would be collected into a graphic novel or uh, volumes of a graphic novel. I'd, but um, that part and I hadn't worked out yet. But the uh, but the I guess what I really wanted to do was uh, make um, an issue comic book. Uh, pamphlets, because uh, that's actually the one thing that I've never done. Um, I've done minis, I've done strips, graphic novels. Uh, I did the, uh, I did those uh, those strips for uh, or those one page strips for Nickelodeon magazine. Mm-hmm. Um, but I've always wanted to do uh, floppies, uh, like a serial story that you know comes out every month and then. You know, at the at the end of the issue, it ends on some crazy cliffhanger, and you're like, "Oh, what's going to happen next?" And yep. you have to wait a month, and you know, and then uh, to continue the story. Um, anyway, so I uh, yeah, I came up with this uh, this. Well, I don't want to I don't want to spoil too much, but uh, yeah. yeah, I came up with this uh, idea for a story um, about uh, essentially this uh, this guy who cannot die. Um, for reasons that will be explained pretty soon, and um, yeah, I uh, I pitched it to Abrams, but uh, yeah, there's there's a few yeah there's a few reasons uh, I don't think um, they wanted to go with it. Well, first of all, uh, they don't do uh, they don't do floppies, mm-hmm. um, and I guess not not a whole lot of publishers do these days. I'm mean, maybe drawn in quarterly. They still do optic nerve, but man, it's yeah, yeah it's it's hard finding uh, finding publishers that are uh, that outside all... of the ones that are doing like yeah. superhero or licensed stories, right? But right. Uh, uh, image is like the last place I think uh, that I can think of where you, like a creator owned thing can be uh, a magazine style comic, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so and then yeah, so it was yeah, it was it was sort of the for- there were some format issues with Abrams, and then also. This story, Jersey. This story is crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the update that updated today, which is when we're recording this is March 19th, 2014. Oh, it was this week. It was Monday. Yeah, and I'm looking at the main character, who happens to look very similar to the character from Meanwhile, as he's looking at his decapitated corpse on a bathroom floor. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Jersey, let me. You know, that's nothing. That's nothing. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> wait, man, wait till wait till you see what happens in a few hundred pages. Oh my. Well, okay, I won't spoil it for you, but oh my gosh. If yeah, if you yeah, when you see what happens, you're gonna you're gonna pee in your pants. You're gonna be like, oh, what? No. Why? Anyways, um but yeah. Anyway, so it's 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 complete insanity. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, that's probably another reason they didn't want to uh, publish it. Was it was it partially was did it have anything to do with uh, target audience like being able to define? Because I know that that's like super important in the book publishing world. Is like who is this for? What shelf do we put this on? Is that part of the difficulty that you ran into? Um, 
It might have been, but they they didn't they didn't say so. Uh, so who knows? Who who really knows what what goes on in the minds sure. of uh, publishers? No, um, I've had my my share of rejection letters, and usually it'll just be something along the lines of "eh, it didn't tickle us." <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, what specifically did it? You know, like what 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 can I fix about it? But uh, but okay, but here's 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 an interesting thought. You got these books, these these critically acclaimed books, published. They I, presumably do them very well. Yet it's not any kind of in, in uh, insulation from you know uh, rejection. That can still happen. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah. I, man, let me tell you. I feel I feel with comics with every with every with every project you you're starting you're starting from the beginning. Uh -huh. Um. It's yeah. It's uh. I mean, you know, there's there. It's great that way because, uh, you know, you're you're constantly having to, you know, re rethink and innovate and try new things. It's you know, um, it kind of forces you not to sort of uh, get stuck in you know some repetitive pattern. Um, but yeah, man, I wish yeah. Sometimes I wish there was a little more uh, stability in the in this field. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it, it's like it takes me back to what I thought when I was a kid, it's like when I was like a teenager, thinking like, "Well, I'm just gonna draw Amazing Spider-Man because I'm awesome at this thing, and uh, that'll be that." You know, I won't have to worry about things anymore because life will just be like good after that. You don't think like you think that it's like you quote unquote make it, and then it'll just be stable after that because that's probably informed by the story we tell ourselves as as Americans this idea of like well you just get a job and clock in for 20 years but <laughs> but right. yeah no i mean it's not like i don't know it's not like getting a union job at a you know car company or something where it's like okay yes i you know i'm in but yeah. yeah man i mean you know i guess if if people like the comic that you're making then it's great and you know uh, but yeah, every every project is a new is a new thing. Um, it's, although I suppose, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess there, yeah, I guess, I guess there are there are careers. Uh, I don't, I don't know. Someone like Kathy Gusweiss or whatever can do, uh, you know, variants on a similar story for decades and decades. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I mean, if you're if you're making if you're making books. Uh, like uh, sort of standalone uh, graphic novel type books. It's yeah, it's tough. Oh, I, I like this idea. Like you said, with every project, you're starting from the beginning, um, starting from scratch, which can be terrifying, but also can be very liberating, right? Yeah. So, um, a story I told on the show before is I was once talking with a friend of mine about a project I wanted to do, and I started talking about, oh, I'm going to market it this way, and I'm going to reach these audiences with it, and it's going to be done in this format, and I'm going to release it in this kind of a schedule, and it'll be really, I think this is a really rock-solid uh, method of releasing, publishing, and marketing this thing. Uh -huh. And my friend said to me very calmly and almost sagely, you do know your first priority is to make a really good story, right? <laughs> And I was like, oh yeah. And like at first I was like, no, no, it's all about getting it to the right people. And then like after I thought about it, I was like, oh yeah, he kind of had a point. Um, so this is this is the big question that I wanted to try to wrap wrap our brains around to to you know because I titled this one you know it's like puzzling out your comics destiny. Uh, you've done it all. You've done mini comics. You've done self published comics. You've been published. Uh, now you're doing web comics. And I'm wondering, after swimming in all these different pools for the past 15 plus years, uh, how has your thinking changed about what comics you'd like to make? And then the second part of the question is, when you're thinking about this, how do you think about where you'd like that comic to live? Right. So, like when I was listening to you talk about Demon, you're like, oh, I got this idea for this thing. It's got these crazy ideas. Boy, I'd like to do a pamphlet. And like I heard some some reasoning in there that was like, I've never done a pamphlet. That'll be fun. And, but then there, I'm guessing there was something about the kind of story that it is that like you thought it would live well in a pamphlet, or was it just like kind of a whimsical decision? Um, well, yeah. De I mean, Demon. Uh, one thing I like to do is uh, I like to design my stories around the format that it's in. Mm -hmm. Um. So I guess to to take an extreme example, uh, 
sometimes, you know, I'll I'll play around with a piece of paper and then I, you know, I can figure out, oh, I can I can fold this into a hexatetra, you know, hexatetraflexagon if, you know, I cut it here and then fold it up here like this. <laughs> and and then I have the form, right? Uh-huh. I have this hexatetraflexagon. But and then, I'll, you know, I'll think, okay, what what kind of stories can I put onto this uh, onto this form? That's an that's an extreme example. Uh-huh. Um, I don't you know I don't come up with the the story first and then try to construct the flexagon around it. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, even I guess even with uh, I guess less less extreme formats like the floppy format. Um, for example, with Demon, I you know I'd like to start with the the format first, which is the floppy, and then think, oh, you know what, you know what, what's great about floppies? You know what's really fun about them? Um, and I guess for for me, one of the uh, one of the fun parts of the floppy is uh, the I guess I think it was Art Spiegelman who said uh, comics is what happens between the panels. Uh, so for me, what uh, one of the greatest parts of the floppy is what happens between the issues. Um, I don't know uh, if you read that uh, the David Boring story by Dan Klaus, but there's that great moment uh, at the uh, at the end of the first issue that ends with a a guy firing a gun, and there's a bullet uh, in the very last panel of the issue. There's a bullet hanging in the air. Uh, coming straight at the uh, at the main character's face, um, and then I think it was a year before that uh, uh, before we got the second issue. So for a whole year, this I re- I just remember there's this bullet just floating in the air and it was driving me nuts. And <laughs> I was just like, oh, how's he gonna get out of it? Um, but uh, but yeah, so. Um, yeah, so, it, so the format or the, the 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 form of the thing can inf- inform what the story is for you. Oh yes, definitely. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, so, it, but but the demons. St- I mean, did you have? Did it start with? Boy, I want to do a floppy. What can I do with a floppy? And then demon came along, or did you have a rough idea of demon? And then you're like, I wonder what I could do with this. Hey, you know what? A floppy. I wonder how that would change what the story is. Um, more, more the second. Um, okay. I had, I had the, I've, I've, I've had the premise of demons sort of kicking around in my head for a while. Okay. Um, but uh, yeah, when um, it was sort of more, uh, it was sort of more nebulous. Um, but when I, when I got the idea that I wanted to do a floppy, or I wanted to do a serial story, that uh. Yeah, that it it really uh it really started to coalesce into the uh into the story that Demon uh uh became. All right, when did it when did the decision happen to say, well, I'll do it as a web comic? And this is my second part of the question: Did that inform or change the way the story came together when you decided, well, I'll do it as a web comic? Um, so let's see. The I guess the uh, hmm, hmm. I don't want to insult any web comics people, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, yeah. To, I guess to be per, yeah, to be perfect. Okay, well, <laughs> you 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 did you did put on your blog that when your friend Derek Kirk Kim was experiencing all this wonderful success with his web comic, same difference. Um, yes. I remember that was a big deal when it was when it was updating. Uh, and he was had a million page views on its final update, and you got all this attention. And your response was "fooey." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, for yeah, for I guess for the longest time, I was kind of a, a web comic skeptic. Mm. Uh, so I yeah I um, I uh, I was I was very anti web comic. Uh, I think. At some, yeah, at some point, kind of as a concession, I just scanned a bunch of my comics and put them up on my website. But uh, I guess I don't. Yeah, I don't even know uh, if, by definition, uh, actually, I don't even know what the definition of web comics are. But I'm pretty sure that yeah. wouldn't really qualify as a web comic, uh, whatever definition you use. Mm. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess um, I started to come around uh, to the idea of web comics. Uh, 
maybe a year or two ago um, when uh, when I was selected as a judge for the Ignatz Award. And uh, they basically dumped, oh my gosh, hundreds and hundreds of web comics into my lap. Uh, and uh, oh my gosh, it was it was crazy. There's, I mean, um, you know, I read I read a lot of comics, uh, like physical comics for the uh, uh, as a judge for the Ignatz Award. But oh my gosh, for every every one of those physical comics, I must have I must have read like a dozen uh, web comics. There's just wow. so so many web comics. Um, I can't. I don't even. I. I still don't know how many web comics there are. There's just <laughs> there's just so many of them. Um, yeah, it's yeah. I wish. Um, actually, you may you may have talked with someone who knows more about web com- comics than me. But uh, yeah, I just I don't even know if anyone if it yeah I don't even know if anyone has a sense of how many there are at this point. There's probably no way of really knowing for sure how many there really are. It's it's God, almost countless, because um, I mean, they, they, there's like uh, you. You also did a blog post recently about like, are we past the golden age of web comics? Because you were looking at what was it, a Wikipedia article, wasn't it? Yes. <clears throat> and it was citing like, here's the notable web comics that came out in this year, and like, and it starts out in the '90s, and there's only a couple, and then you get to like the early 2000s, and it just explodes this whole bunch, and then it starts to taper out again when we get to like 2011, 2012. Not as many are popping up. But, uh, you know, you have to wonder if that's a signal-to-noise ratio kind of thing where there's so many now that, you know, uh, there's a lot, a lot of good ones. You know, I can name, like, a, a dozen really good web comics off the top of my head. Right. Um, but how many are there total? Who knows? It's, yeah, it's ridiculous. But that's great, right? That's a good thing. I mean, everybody has ac- access to the, to the pool, as it were. Yeah. But, um. but here you are reading these. Flip, yes. flip, flip, you know, and like uh, I, I can't even imagine trying to read, you know, hundreds of web comics in a several month period. That that was like a real job, uh, I bet. <laughs> oh my gosh, it was so many. Yeah, I felt. Yeah, I mean, I tried to. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel I feel bad about admitting this, but I did not read every every web. I did not read every panel of every web comic that was sent to me. How uh, could you? You couldn't. You couldn't. I mean, yeah. not, not with numbers like that, no. Um, yeah, at a, at a certain point, I just, you know, I just had to limit myself. You know, I'll read three. I'll read if it's a strip. I'll read three strips. Yeah. Uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a story, you know, I'll read a few pages, and then, yeah, even then, oh my gosh, it just took months to to read them, uh, to read all of these. But uh, I guess the. Um, the great part, uh, or sort of the eye opener for me, was uh, just, just I mean, just seeing all this creativity uh, out there in the field. Um, it sort of, uh, it sort of reminded me of when uh, I just started out and first discovered uh, mini comics, um, and just realized, what well, you know, what are these things? There's so many of them. Uh, who, what, where? Um, or maybe uh, I don't know if you've ever uh, been to France or Japan and just wa- you know walking into a comic book store there and just seeing you the know variety. all these titles that you have no idea what you know what they are and entire genres that you didn't know existed. So um, yeah, it was just uh, that was probably uh, one of the biggest eye openers for me. Um, just uh, yeah, just seeing the immensity of the field um, and uh, you know there you know other things like uh, I guess the advent of tablets um, for for whatever reason uh, I need to I need to hold the thing that I'm reading um, so <clears throat> until until tablets came along I re- yeah I never it was re- it was really tough for me to uh, sit in front of a monitor and read web comics um and uh yeah you know just other other little incremental improvements uh in technology along the way so it's uh, the the platform's matured a little bit like enough to where you can you know it's it, it's not as big a leap for you to say okay this is enough like a traditional reading experience that I can play now 
Yeah. Yeah. But, but uh, also, I love that idea. Like, you know, when you talked about going back to what you said, every, with every project you're starting from the beginning, what better way to start a new thing than to refresh yourself by saying, oh, here's a whole bunch of examples of people who are not taking the medium for granted and are doing all sorts of interesting things and just sharing whatever, right? And now I can come back to this thing afresh. Yes. Um, but, uh, okay, so did, when you decided, all right, I'll come into this web comics <laughs> thing after all. Uh, <laughs> Did that change the way you wrote Demon, or was Demon pretty crystallized by then? Um, so uh, Demon was pretty crystallized by then. Um, I'd actually penciled the whole thing out um, because uh, I want yeah I wanted I wanted to have every single page penciled, uh, but by the time I submitted it to Abrams. Um, so the whole the whole thing's penciled out. There's not uh, there's not too much uh, that changed since I decided uh, to uh, turn it into a web comic. Wow. So um, you th you you thumbnailed or sketched or penciled 700 pages. No wonder. Yeah, you said you've been working on this for three years. So holy cow. Um, yeah, but uh, I guess right now I'm just uh, I'm just going through and inking the pages, and as as I ink them, I put them up online, uh, one page every weekday, and uh, yeah, uh, that's I guess I guess I am now making a web comic. <laughs> <laughs> that's 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 kind of how it came to be. Um, it's uh yeah I wish um yeah I wish I could tell your listeners that I uh you know that that was the plan from the very beginning but uh well but no I actually I think that is this is the stuff that I think is so fascinating you know my favorite thing in the world when I'm discussing these kind of topics with cartoonists is not the advice but the the moments where you are vulnerable and you say you know I was trying to figure it out. I thought I was supposed to go this way, but it turned out I was supposed to go that way. That is so much more interesting to me than somebody going, all right, well, this is how you do a webcomic. You sit down and you, <laughs> <laughs> right? you use these kind of plugins, you update this kind of these days a week, and then you're going to get this kind of fan base, and then you make these kind of t-shirts, right? Um, any artist worth their salt is never going to tell you that, right? Um, I, I, think, I think what's interesting here is that there was a lot of different factors informing this decision to, be, to make it, uh, Demon into a webcomic, right? Uh, you, you tried it through the publishing route. There, were, there was friction there. Okay, well, let's do pamphlets. There's friction there. All right, I'm whittling down to what this thing needs to be. It's almost like the circumstances are acting as cooperators with your, with your own desires to make the thing. Does that sound terribly poetic and dumb? <laughs> Uh, no, that sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> That's about the shape of things. <laughs> um, but oh my gosh, let yeah, if yeah, my yeah, that's 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 my life story. Like, <laughs> just uh, yeah, just not having any clue what I'm doing and stumbling into things and uh, just trying to figure things out as I go along. Um, but it starts with, going back to that advice my friend gave me, it starts with having a good idea for a story or a good story or a neat thing that is inspired by a, a, a moment of curiosity about form, right? What could I make out of a, out of, I forget what kind of a hedron that you were making. Uh, I want to say, it, was, it wasn't a dodecahedron. What was the shape? Uh, it, was a, it was a flexagon. A flexagon. Yes, it was a hexatetraflexagon. A hexatetraflexagon. <laughs> How many sides are on that thing? Um, it uh, I guess it depends how you want to count sides, but yeah. uh, there's basically two sides. Um, it's not it's not a Mobius strip if uh, if you okay. unfold the whole thing. Okay. Um, it's uh. See, I was imagining something like like a, a 400 sided die kind of thing, which I've seen oh. people make comics on things like like a 20 sided die or something like that. I actually uh, I saw a Rubik's cube recently where somebody turned it into a comic that you could like mix up, which I thought was really cool. Oh yeah, was this the uh, Peter Conrad one? Maybe it was at the um, oh my gosh, it was at the art show in Columbus. I'm forgetting the name of the of the of the gallery, and I'm gonna feel like a jerk for forgetting the name of the gallery. Somebody in the chat room help me out. <laughs> but, but I think that might have been it. Um, cause it yeah, that one was great. That one was fantastic. Yeah. But I, yeah, I like that idea too of like you know like let 
the form inform part of the actual narrative piece of the thing as well. Um, because that, 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 I mean, this is another theme that we've discussed on the show in the past is limitations inspire creativity, right? Like, the more limitations you put on the thing, the harder it is to get out of it, the more creative solutions you have to come up with in order to uh, solve the problem, right? Because right. a, a lot of times storytelling is, is solving problems. Yes. Uh, okay, well, we got book recommendations in a minute here. Uh, I want to make sure that I get, give you a chance for a final thought on this thing about, uh, you know, how to decide what project to do and in what form it should have. Um, did I miss anything on that whole topic, Jason? Oh, uh, man, I guess, um, yeah. Uh, ah, gosh, uh, you know, I'd say um, maybe... Uh, you know, if I yeah, if I could if I could give advice to uh, people starting out, I'd say don't uh, try not to worry too much about uh, the the money side of things. Um, I think uh, oh, who was it that you had Spike Trotman? Yeah, on Spike Trotman. Yeah. Um, yeah, she she had some really excellent advice um, about Kickstarter. And uh, that was that was actually one of the things uh, that was kind of an eye opener for me. But um, I guess a lot of uh, man, there's been some uh, there's been some real like blockbuster Kickstarter campaigns recently. Um, I don't know if you've seen them, but they you know they're getting like a hundred thousand dollars or something crazy. Yeah, some web comics raised a million, a million bucks. What was it? Order of the Stick did that a couple of years back, right? Yeah, I saw Bonkers. that. That was crazy. Yeah. Um. But uh, yeah, I, um, I don't know. It's um, it's oh yeah, it's always it's oh comics is always uh, sort of this weird uh, I don't know. It's this weird medium because it's um, it's it's both commerce, right? They're, you're you know you're you're making these pro, you know either physical booklets or uh, you know web comics in exchange for money. Um, so there's this yeah, I feel. Yeah, I feel there's uh, there's sort of a lot of pressure for uh, cartoonists starting out um, to uh, to I don't know uh, either turn it into a profession um, or be you know be. Uh, I gotta make the marketable thing. I gotta make the thing that that people want, and I gotta right. find out what people want and make that thing right. Right. Yeah. Um. But yeah, man, I yeah, if yeah, if I could yeah, if I could give any advice, I'd I'd say, you know, don't don't worry about that stuff. Um it's yeah, it's uh you got you know, you just got to think about uh you know, make, making the best comic that you can make. That's what I would uh that's what I would recommend. Which is it it's sounds so simple. So simple that it almost sounds like something Mom would say at graduation, right? <laughs> right? But when you sit down to do it and you try to make the best comic you can make, oh my gosh, is that hard? That is like the hardest thing ever, and one of the most profound challenges you could possibly take on, right? Because uh, so much is going on in every page. So it's uh, oh, but <laughs> there's oh, I, well, I don't, yeah, I don't want to be negative, but oh my gosh, there's so I don't know, yeah, when I walk around a comic convention there's so I don't know man there's so many comics where there's a lot of half-hearted attempts <laughs> yeah can we, can we put it that oh, way oh yeah I think well yeah I'm gonna get the name wrong well it's probably for the best but yeah some, someone was selling a comic called like crappy comics or shitty comics or something <laughs> oh that was the title of their comic I was, I, you know I wanted to go up to this guy and say why are you doing this right right take some pride in your work man uh, I'm gonna open up a restaurant called stinky food <laughs> I'm gonna open up a fast food place called Botulism. How about that? No. I, I, yeah, there's, 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 there's a fine line between self-depreciating humor and you know putting yourself down publicly, right? <laughs> um, um, yeah, I've got a, yeah, I've got a, I've got a kid now. I've got a, I've got a baby. Every you know when I wake up in the morning, I think you know every comic could be my last one. I got I got to make this one count. <laughs> I, is, is, has he said dad yet? By the way, um, not really. Oh, he knows he knows the words for up. 
Yeah. Uh, he can say up. He knows the word for Pinocchio. <laughs> um, milk. Uh, but not dad. <laughs> but no, not it's not dad. Uh, or <laughs> pa or whatever. I don't know. <laughs> It'll come. My my ego, yeah, my 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 ego's a little bruised to be honest. Um, but, but, but I, I do like that idea too. That it's it's. I don't want to start putting like uh, anxiety about the Grim Reaper into the discussion, but but this kind of sense that you know when once you make a really big project, and Jason, you've made a bunch of really big books, um, length, right? A lot of work goes into these things. And you start to realize as you get a little older, it's like, oh, I only got X amount of books left if I if if I live to this age, right? So yes. I better be careful about what I choose to do, and I better make sure that's something that I really really care about, and not fritter away some time on something just because, oh, well, Dad says this is a good idea for a book. Um, yes, yes. Empire, Empire yes. State. Empire yes. State. That's great advice. Think, yeah, think it. Frame it that way. <laughs> frame it that way. <laughs> Youth of today, you know, you only have seven books in you. Don't don't waste one of those books on a, a book called Crappy Comics. <laughs> you really want that to be one of your seven? No. <laughs> by, by the way, my my apologies to the creator of Crappy Comics. I I know I didn't actually read your comic. I just right. saw the title. You're you're pointing out what that title telegraphs to you <laughs> as a consumer, right? For, yeah, I mean, okay, the, yeah. Disclosure. For all I know, crap the. The crappy comic comic is is a, a wonderful comic. So yeah, just my, and, my apologies. And it too. might be it might be a joke of irony. And so, but but you're pointing out how the messaging is problematic in that situation, <laughs> right? Yeah. But but yeah, Empire State was a personal work, right? I mean, this thing was based on a real life experience, and I don't think it's autobiographical per se, right? But no, it's well, it's very, very slightly vaguely. Yeah. I mean, you have this young man uh, traveling across the country by bus and meeting characters that I hope you didn't meet in real life, uh, Jason. But, uh, but then going, to, you know, this this boy from Oakland. Oh, you happen to be from the Oakland area. Going to New York and and, and experiencing something. And this is one thing I want to I want to end with a compliment to you. One of the things I love about your work, uh, both the, the the choose your own kind of comics, but then also your you know uh, just general fiction comics is you don't walk away from ambiguity. And one of the things that a choose-your-own-adventure kind of story invites is ambiguity. Is it going to be this way or is it going to be that way? You get to choose. And then in Empire State, even though it's a, it's a lin... Oh, I hit my mouth and I'm like... <laughs> it's a linear narrative, um, but it ends... Oh, I don't want to spoil the ending for people. People need to read it. But it ends in this way where, you know, somebody says, look out the window, and he looks out the window. And I don't think you could have chosen a better moment to say, like, is it better or worse for him now? Uh, it, was, it was a lovely way to end the book. So, uh, but yeah, I, I would say that anybody who's a big fan of ambiguity and storytelling should definitely read Jason Shiga's work. Oh, well, thank you very much. Uh, and that's not an easy thing to do, you know, to let people walk in with their own assumptions about things and get to make their own interpretation of things. Uh, there, there's, there's a real art to that. Uh, Tin Pham is another guy who does that really well. Uh, Sumo ended in a very similar way where like, it got a little goose bumpy. Uh, yeah. I, can only, I can only aspire to be able to, to have that kind of poetic ambiguity in my work. So, okay, we're going to get to book recommendations. Uh, Rachel Moyer, Moyer is in the room with... Hi, uh, Rachel. Hi there. Uh, PLA. At the Ann Arbor District okay. Library, which is a what? Remind me what that is again. My go-to uh, metaphor is library Padawan, but uh, library Padawan. Uh, yeah, it means I'm still in library school, but they're nice enough to let me work here and learn all the inside secrets. So, are you one of the good Padawans or the whiny Padawans? I like to think I'm one of the good Padawans, <laughs> but I mean, I can't really speak to that. Continuing the Star Wars metaphor, they come in two varieties. They either come in like, "Yes, Master, I will do what you say," or "Oh, but come on, Master, I want to do a cool teenager thing." <laughs> not going to Tasha Station to pick up some power converters. Well, I, I just started watching Clone Wars, and I noticed that there's, there's like those kinds of the themes kind of pop up in there. But anyway, mm -hmm. so yes, you are a Padawan. You are studying to be a librarian. You are doing the work of a librarian, uh, and you are engaging uh, in all the responsibilities of a librarian. With, That's without about the title. right. Yep, and <laughs> I get to do all the fun stuff like recommend comments. All so. right, so so uh, Jason, I I warned you that we'd be doing some book recommendations. I'm gonna let Rachel go first while you sum up your thoughts on any that you might have. Okay. All right. 
All right, so what do you got for us, Rachel? All right, I got three things this time, which I think is becoming my standard. So I'm starting off here with Thor the Mighty Avenger. Uh, this is a couple years is old. Is that the Roger Langridge one? It is, and Chris Samney. It was a short-run yeah, series, and, which is very sad because it's a very excellent series. It's, um, it's out of continuity, which mm. is pretty great for someone who is starting comics because, you know, we all love how much detail you can get, I think, if you're a fan of the mainstream <laughs> comics in terms of the history of the characters, but it's completely baffling for new people. So this is a great book for learning to love the character, um, and I love it because basically what it is is Thor gets trapped on Earth, he's sleeping on Jane Foster's couch, and he's learning to love the world, our world, while beating up bad guys. <laughs> so it's a pretty straightforward Oh, kind you of mean story. it's character-driven? Oh, yeah. Definitely, oh, and Chris it, Samney's art is really great. Very and it expressive. It doesn't it doesn't tie into any multiverse kind no. of re, retconning resets. Nope, it's its own self-contained version of the universe. So okay. you don't have to know, you know, fifty years of history to get it. So I which, bet it's funny too, because it's Roger Langridge. Like yeah, it's, it's got humor. It's great. Yeah. So well, cool. So then, Thor: The Mighty Avenger by Roger Langridge. Can't recommend his stuff enough. Mm, All right. I, the other thing about it is it's actually. All ages, um, which all ages in the sense that it is accessible to people of many different ages. Uh, I know a lot of all ages books. People look at it and they think, "Oh, it's for kids," which is not a problem. I love all ages comics that are for kids. Yeah. Which it could air on primetime TV. That's, right. That's yep. what this kind of all ages yep. means, right? It's okay. a. It could be a good family book, I would say. Hmm. Um, all right. Now you've got something that Dan Mishkin has said was the single greatest superhero invented Indeed. in the last thirty years. And that is Static Shock yeah. from the late, great Dwayne McDuffie. And this volume is Rebirth of Cool. It um, has the first four issues um, from the original Static comic, it, as well as the uh, four-issue miniseries called Rebirth of Cool. Um, Static is you know, a superhero that controls electricity, but um, I think the best way to explain how great Static is is to explain how he gets his powers. So you've got this nerdy uh, black high school kid, he's like 14 years old, who's getting bullied and pushed around, and all the people in his life are kind of pushing him to the point where he ends up in this alley with a gun, and the bully is across the way. And he has that moment where it's like, am I going to kill this bully and like be the man, which is what people are kind of saying to me. And he doesn't. But being there, he's in the right place at the right time or the wrong place at the wrong time and he gets caught in uh, this bang of muti mutagenic gas and gets his superpowers and becomes this superhero, Static Shock. Um, it's a really great superhero book because it does have a lot of, uh, it's you know, it's got the action and all that. We all love that in superhero books, but it's a great book for exploring, you know, the human dynamic a and little more deeply than a lot of superhero books do. Okay. And Dwayne McDuffie. Amazing, right? Oh, yeah. He made Justice League Unlimited, the cartoon mm -hmm. that it was. Also, Dennis Cohen. What is prettier than his ink lines? For for true, real, guys. True. I mean, anybody who's, even if you're just a fan of comic art, I, God, I can't get enough of that guy's ink lines. I mean, he's up there with, like, Simonson, uh, with, like, that, that kind of energetic, loose, mm -hmm. vibrant ink line. So it's, pretty. It's definitely a book I like to read slowly. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Okay, and then what, what's what, what's the final one on the list here? The last thing is a much newer thing, and uh, I'm kind of excited about it because I just read it last week, So, and that's um, Finding Gossamer. Mm. And this book, um, the basic premise is there's a brother and sister. The brother is, uh, in the words of his sister, he's not a genius. It's just that he can't be wrong. He sees a problem, he solves it. He can't not solve it. Um, so they're at... He's presented with this ancient mathematical theorem and pushed to solve it. And solving it opens this door to another fantastical world where math is basically magic. <laughs> and it's not the only door that's open. You have that's like another... this crazy green wizard doing oh, yeah. like equations for his oh, spells. Oh yeah, it's great. And yeah. it's a, of course, they're not the only ones that enter a door through that world and they're now trapped because what he has is the solution to the problem and not the problem itself, and he needs both to be able to travel. So he and his sister in this world. Um, it's beautiful art. It's actually Sarah Ellerton, which um, I didn't realize until I started reading it, and hmm. kind of have a history with her. She is a webcomics artist. She did um, the web self-contained webcomics Inverlock, Dreamless, and uh, Phoenix or Queen, ah. which are 
Inverlock was one of my first webcomics, so I got really excited about that. But it's a very um, expressive sort of... Um, I think they were kind of going towards a Pixar look. It's yeah. mentioned quite a few times in the back copy of the book. Yeah, you can um, see it. No hard lines, so it's not like... like if you don't digital like... Digital painterly style. Very, yes, very much digital painterly style. And it's a, the brother and sister relationship is really great in this. It's um, the... The relationship is a lot more complex than I expected from this kind of book. Uh, the main the main character Denny, the small boy, he actually seems to present as uh, being on the autism spectrum. It's specifically never uh, diagnosed, as it were, in the book. I mm. did a little poking on their Facebook. It's a question <laughs> they're asked a lot, but it it makes a for a very um, complex kind of relationship between him and his sister who has to act as his caregiver. Actually, on some level, it kind of reminds me of Lilo and Stitch in that respect. Ah, which yeah. That's why I love Lilo and Stitch, is this interplay between the sisters and all that. Well, one of the reasons. Yeah. The movie. <laughs> Favorite Disney movie. But anyway, it's a very good read, and you know, you think with something where the, um, the magic of the world is math, it's going to be very didactic and kind of tiresome in that respect, but it's not. It's just... Mm. Math is magic. Isn't that awesome? Math is awesome. So wow, it's it's not um, a teachy book. If I know saying that math is magic in the world kind of gives that impression, it's not. It's just a pretty solid uh, fantasy story. But there's enough math that if I am uh, somebody who is interested in mathematics or have like a passing interest, there'll be enough to make me more curious. Um, or no. It's hard for me to really say. Like, uh, they're not going around explaining mathematical concepts. Uh, uh -huh. There are theorems and things, and the visualization of the magic is these mathematical things. Um, I don't think if you're wanting to like see problems being solved uh, that this is the book for you. <laughs> maybe it, it's not like XKCD level of you know kind of mathematical humor or anything like okay. that. But I know if I was a kid, like I hated math as a child, and I've only come to appreciate it as, you know, something beautiful, not something I want to do, but something beautiful as I've gotten older. But I think it's having that as part of the plot is a good way to trick a kid into thinking math might be okay. Yeah. Without actually making them do any well, of it. Sometimes, but that, sometimes that's not the primary thing. Okay. It's it's, it's primarily it's a fantasy world sure. with a really strong characters and yeah. fun. Oh, cool. Finding Gossamer. Is that... Mm -hmm. in and that's from, uh, I believe, Third World. Third World. Never heard of them. Um, the writer is David A. Rodriguez, and apparently he is the lead writer for Skylanders Swap Force, which I know is pretty popular with the kids, so that's another way to kind of oh. get them interested, perhaps. Love Skylanders. I'm bummed out that Swap Force, you have to get the new system. I was, like, holding out, like, I'm not getting the new system, and then, like, oh, Swap Force. Oh, I am a no. poor college student. I have none of the systems. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, Jason, uh, I'm wondering what you have on your recommended list for this episode. Um, well, I wanted uh, I wanted to recommend a series of books called *The Drifting Classroom* by Kazuo Umezu. Mm. Um, now, uh, this was a manga series written in the '70s by one of my favorite, probably my favorite cartoonist of all time. Um, one uh, one thing I like to do as a cartoonist is. Uh, I don't know if you play this game with your cartoonist friends, but I like to imagine if I could have any uh, career from the history of comics, uh, whose career would I want? And, uh, <laughs> it usually comes down to either um, Yoshihiro Tatsumi, uh, who did uh, A Drifting Life mm, yeah. uh, most recently, or um, Kazuo Umezu. Uh, he's a horror writer. Uh, who started off in the 50s um, doing horror manga, girls manga, and um, and then uh, just uh, as his career uh, evolved over the course of about 50 years, he just went bananas and started doing these really ambitious uh, projects, and the, the horror got more horrific. Um, yeah, I'm seeing an explicit content tag on the cover of The Drifting Classroom as I'm looking at it. <laughs> yeah, so. he's, he's, he's probably, uh, like I said, he's, my, he's probably my favorite uh, living cartoonist. And um, 
the nice thing about uh, Japanese careers is you get to see uh, they have like a, a really nice sort of early, middle, and late uh, stage to their careers. Um, and the stuff he was doing, uh, the last project he did before he died was this insane book called uh, 14, um, which, yeah, just goes on for, I think, 20-something volumes. Um, but I think it, probably his greatest achievement was this book he did in the 70s called A Drifting Classroom. And uh, the premise is, uh, is pretty simple. Um, or it starts off pretty simple, which is uh, these kids, uh, they're going to school, and suddenly there's an earthquake, um, and uh, after the earthquake's over, the kids look outside of uh, the window, and outside the uh, schoolyard, uh, or outside the, um, the boundaries of the school, is a desert wasteland that stretches on for infinity. Um, and they, uh, the kids, at first, they don't know what happened, but they eventually figure it out that they've been transported into the future. Um, and I guess the, uh, the humans have not been very good stewards of the environment because the Earth is now this, uh, this giant desert uh, with uh, giant uh, scorpion bugs roaming, uh, roaming, roaming the desert. Um, so uh, at that point, it basically turns into a Lord of the Flies type situation. And uh, the kids have to learn how to survive with limited resources. Uh, and, well, it, yeah, I mean, it just gets crazier and crazier with every volume. And the, the whole thing is 11 volumes. Um, I, was, uh, I was able to get uh, all 11 copies at the, uh, at the San Francisco Public Library. Uh, they uh, they had the entire set, uh, which was great because um, it would, I imagine for an average uh, comics fan, it would be difficult buying uh, all 11 volumes. Um, so it was, yeah, it was great being able to read them, uh, uh, being able to read library copies. Yeah. And it, uh, yeah, um, gosh, I don't know what else to say about it other than it is, uh, it is a masterpiece. So I would I would highly recommend it, and uh, I'll I'll tell you one little more tidbit about uh, this cartoonist Kazuo Umezu, which is I love this cartoonist so much that I named my own son Kazuo after the cartoonist after the cartoonist. Wow, wow. Okay, that's as high of an, an endorsement as you could possibly make. <laughs> <laughs> so it looks like this came out from Viz a while back. So we'll have to see about it. I didn't find it uh, in the AADL collection. We'll have to see about getting it for AADL's collection. It looks pretty awesome. Yeah, uh, it was great. Um, uh, yeah, probably one of my uh, favorite manga series of all time. Wow. Uh, the Drifting Classroom by Kazuo Umezu. Is that you see his last name? Uh, that's right. And, uh, oh, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you one more, one more thing. <laughs> Um, on our honeymoon, my wife and I went to Tokyo, and uh, I managed to track down Kazuo Mezu's house, and I rung his doorbell. <laughs> did he answer? He did not answer, unfortunately. Oh, oh that would have been such a great ending to the story. <laughs> uh, who knows? Maybe he heard it ring. I don't, I don't know. He was like, I don't know that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's it's possible that that in years to come he will know of you, and then he will ring your doorbell because my book recommendation is going to be Empire State uh, because I just reread it in preparation for this episode, and it is a very sweet slice of life sort of narrative that doesn't do any of the um, the navel gazing that that slice of life gets a bad rap for because there's there's really great slice of life stuff like Derek Kirk Kim stuff. But uh, then there's also stuff where it's like, okay, well, this is really kind of like reading a 17-year-old's diary. And which, which th that's for a certain audience, too, right? There are some people who want to read that. But um, what I love about this is that uh, it doesn't feel like Jason's taking... And I'm, I'm, I'm giving you a review while you're standing here. This, this is uncomfortable. But it doesn't feel like... It, it didn't feel like Jason was taking any, like, extreme position one way or the other. There's a scene where the main character who has a f feelings for this girl, he meets... The girl's new bow, 
Like she moves away, he goes to visit her. He goes through this this uh, heartbreaking journey to go visit her, and he gets there, and she's got another guy, right? And you know what to expect from that moment, right? We've seen the movies, we've seen the Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks movies, and all those kinds of movies where what that moment is supposed to be like. And the way Jason plays it is so subtle, and you don't take a position on that other guy. He's he's actually a pretty nice guy. <laughs> he's a really nice guy. Uh, is I think the word was avuncular <laughs> in, the, in the book. Um, and I and I feel like that, that that's the tone of this thing is like it's really you you get to have your own reactions to some of these things in the story although there are some truly you know terrible heartbreaking moments within as well but it it it, it was really surprising how how ambiguous a lot of the 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 moments where I expected a corny dun 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 instead I got this moment where I was walking away questioning well was that such a bad thing. You know, was our hero wrong in going to find her after all? You know, should I not be rooting for him in this situation? Um, so hats off to you for that. And I think a lot of people should read the, the book as a result of that. You know, I have to say, I just love how you use um, color as part of the story as well. Yeah. It's really, really excellent. Yeah, we should say, because like, there's a lot of time jumping in this book, too. A lot of like going back and forth. And so different scenes will have different colors as part of the, the cue for that, I think, as well uh, as... Uh, yes, I have, to, I have to give credit where credit is due. Uh, John Pham did the colors for Empire State. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Um, but yeah, he, uh, he used it to great effect to, uh, to uh, sort of clarify um, uh, the, the sort of chronology of the events in the book. Um, so uh, the, uh, the, the original version of Empire State was actually a mini-comic, uh, which was in black and white. And it was, uh, I think it was pretty confusing for readers uh, figuring out uh, where they were in the story. Because um, it, would, it would jump around in time uh, f fairly abruptly. But uh, yeah, man, once, once John added those colors, it was, uh, it was, it was pretty clear. Um, uh, except when I didn't want it to be where the uh, where the the reader was um, in uh, in time in the story. Mm. Is that where like the colors become mixed, where you'll have both blue and red in some of the sequences? Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's the part where um, I didn't want the reader uh, to know what uh, when when those parts of the story took place. Yeah, whether it was before or after his trip. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, wow. So you now I got to read it again with that in mind. Uh, okay, well, gosh, guys, this was a, a super, super fun episode. Thank you so much, Jason, for being uh, on the show at long last and uh, hanging out with me. Uh, I hope we can do it again. Yeah, we do. <laughs> <laughs> so we, if, if people listen to this and watched it and they said, gosh, that Jason Shiga, he is just something else. I need to get more of that guy in my life. Where is the one place they should go to find out more about you and what you're up to lately? Um, let's see. Well, I guess they could visit my website, which is uh, shigabooks.com, or uh, they can just Google my name, Jason Shiga, and I think uh, uh, they can find my website that way pretty quickly. Um, and uh, I think, um, yeah, other than that, I'd say uh, go to your local library and ask if they have any books by Jason Shiga. That's a really good idea, actually. Uh, go to your local library or your school library and say, where are the Jason Shiga books, please? Uh, and then, Rachel, is there anything going on that we need to talk about in terms of local events? Well, we've got our uh, upcoming um, Comics Artist Forum, of course, which is going to be April 6th mm -hmm. uh, here at the library from 1 to 3. And we've got, and I'm going to butcher his name again. I Joshua just Hoke. It. Joshua Hoke. I want to say Hokey, but that's not right. <laughs> Hoke of Tales of the Brother 3. Uh -huh. And he's going to be here talking to us about taking stories from your life and turning it into comics. And then maybe not directly comics related, but we have a couple other things folks might want to know about. We've got yep. the Emerging Writers Workshop, mm. which is this Thursday, uh, March 20th, from 7 to 8.45 at our Traverwood branch. And that's just sort of uh, a get-together of people who are writers, aspiring writers. We have a couple local authors there that will be acting as a resource that's... Um, Laura Zeeland and Margaret Young. So mm. if you want to come up by and chat about writing, that's a place to do it. Traverwood Branch, you said? Traverwood Branch, okay. on Thursday, March 20th. And then we have Nerd Night Ann Arbor, which is now free because the library is covering your costs. So that's oh. going to be Thursday the 27th. Uh, that's going to be an adult event because it is at live. There will be 
adult beverages present, and it's kind of like um, as they call them in Texas, refreshments. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that's kind. Of, if you don't know about Nerd Night, it's kind of like um, short Discovery Channel style presentations on all kinds of crazy topics. I know there was one I think last time on like the science of beer making and something about 3D printing, and so it covers a wide range of topics. And so that's going to be Thursday, the 27th, from 6:30 to 9:30 at Live, which is on First Street. And then the last thing I want to let people know about is um, we're actually working to add some more content and stuff to our comics website here at AADL, and that's comics.aadl.org. So I now have a uh, email address I can give you guys, which is comics at aadl.org. And if you um, email us there, we're going to start taking art submissions if anyone wants to like submit a comic to put on the library website. Uh, we're going to start trying to build an artist directory for folks in the area, and then just uh, create a list of resources. So if there's anything you think that everybody else that's a comics creator should know about, I don't know. We got like things. like uh, Wally Wood's 22 panels that always work. That for sure, thing. that's on my list. Yeah. Uh, so is the Disney Animators Toolkit, mm -hmm. things like Pixlr.com, stuff like Fire Alpaca, anything of that nature. Any kind of stuff about podcasting, I know you have quite a few links about that. Oh, that's so right, yeah. Anything that you think that uh, another artist might be interested in that we can link around. So Sweet. So that's comics at aadl.org is the that's email address. That's correct. Oh, awesome. All right, well, I got a couple other uh, local events as well in uh, at EMU, oh, Eastern yeah. Michigan University. There's a comics gallery show going on until April 16th, original art curated by art history professor Richard Rubenfeld. It's called Kapow. Uh, and that's, got, they've got some great stuff over there. They've got, what, Jeff Smith, Dave Peters, David Peterson, uh -huh. uh, Cool. the Cuberts, I think. Oh. So. Uh, that's at art.emich.edu, uh, but we'll put the full link in the show notes. And then uh, also the 28th through the 30th in Mount Clemens, Michigan, there's a new comic convention starting in uh, Michigan called the Deluxe Entertainment Expo. Interesting idea for this one. It's actually like a comics slash mar martial arts event. No, I did see something about that. Did you that. see that? Yeah, and like I talked with the guy who runs it because mm -hmm. he, he invited me to come, and uh, he was talking about how you know like well martial arts teaches young people discipline, self confidence, and mm -hmm. solving problems, and he didn't see any disparity between that and what you know good comics for young people teaches them. So he thought that why not those two worlds collide? Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting. It, it's in Mount Clemens. Is at the Gibraltar Trade Center? Okay, so. Yeah. Um, I think I saw that there was going to be a, quite a few martial arts demonstrations there. So. Yeah, and they're going for some world records, like the most Ninja Turtle costumes in one place. Because <laughs> 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 Kevin Eastman's going to be there uh, doing All some right. talks, and I'm going to be leading some workshops for kids at that, at that event. So that's at DLUXExpo.com. So, all right. This episode will be archived at comicsagreat.com slash CAG95. Thank you, Rachel Moyer, for uh, the great book recommendation recommendations. Thank you to Jason, Jason Shiga for the great talk. Thanks to Matt Dubay and Eric Kloster in the control room, keep, keeping track of all the links and doing all the television switching. Uh, until next time, everybody, I've been Jersey Drozd of ComicsAreGreat.com and Jersey on Twitter. Okay, bye. Bye.